Reading from the book by Connor McDarry, Alternative Historian, republished in 1963, I believe. Connor McDarry wrote this book, which is fascinating. I want to share it with anyone who has an open mind and also anyone who understands language, etymology, and linguistics or is interested in understanding those things. Connor McDarry, along with Commons Beaumont and Ignatius Donnelly and others, have postulated that the origins of writing into historical texts for the purpose of history may have originated in Scandinavia, Northern Europe, and the British Isles, and uh, much of it in Ireland, ancient Ireland. So Connor McDarry wrote this book, which is pretty compelling. It's called Irish Wisdom Preserved in Bible and Pyramids. And I'm going to be reading chapter 11 of the book. There's a lot of context that you're not going to get just by reading this one chapter, but hopefully it'll pique some interest in people to check out the work of Connor McDarry. I've studied a lot of etymology myself, and there is definitely, definitely a phonetic link uh, to ancient Hebrew to uh, the Gaelic language, um, also Welsh, or what we call Old, Old Irish. There's a lot of information out there on the connection between the Irish Druidic teachings, mystery school, and sages known as Magi or Magi, as the authors of the original stories that make up the Bible. Now, a lot of people haven't heard about this, but there's reasons for that. So you kind of have to dig deeper and ask yourself, could it be possible? And if so, why haven't I heard about this yet? So hopefully, hopefully this will bring some, some insight into some people. Uh, chapter 11. The title of this chapter by Connor McDarry is called the Irish, the first cultural nation, the earliest missionary teachers, and the great temple builders of the ancient world. One of the aims of the propaganda for spreading misinformation regarding Ireland was to create an impression because of the similarity between the customs of the Irish and those of the Hindus, that the Irish and their customs came originally from the East or India. Really, on the contrary, this fact only confirms the truth that the Irish gave their customs to the Hindus during their missionary sojourn in that country. The Hindus have never been known as a colonizing race, while we have overwhelming evidence to show that Ireland was the greatest colonizing country of the ancient world. They were the real pathfinders of the world, as the likelihood of a Hindu migration to Ireland in the past, the author of Atlantis says on page 416, The Hindus have never within the knowledge of a man set out colonies or fleets for exploration, but there is an abundant evidence, on the other hand, of migrations from Atlantis eastward. And how, he asks, could the Sanskrit writings have preserved maps of Ireland, England, and Spain, giving the shape and outline of their coasts and their very names, and yet have preserved no memory of the expeditions or colonizations by which they acquired their knowledge. End quote. So it's interesting that the ancient Sanskrit writings, um, well, first we should just start by saying Hinduism is a solar culture, and if you read the origins of their history, which I've talked about before, they tell you that they... Um, that they are worship the sun and they have different names for the sun but this is also the same thing that the ancient Arya pre-Druidic peoples of Ireland were heavy sun worshippers because in that part of the world it was pretty rough and they followed the sun to navigate the seas and they were well known to be some of the greatest shipbuilders uh, in history still are and have brought that shipbuilding technology to other nations because they had a need to leave. They had a need to learn how to navigate the seas. Whereas, according to this, the Indian people in general didn't have that 
their geography didn't promote colonization. It didn't promote seafaring, traveling across complete oceans to find new lands. Also, it's said in the Bhagavad Gita and the Rig Veda and the Upanishads that they got their wisdom was brought to them by a group of people called the Aryans, A-R-Y-A-N. Um, it's a misnomer to think that the Aryans are a race. That's something that was invented in the early 20th century and more propaganda. But the word Aryan uh, just means of high rank or nobility, uh, sort of kingly or royalty, smart, intelligent. And so when the Aryans brought their knowledge to the Hindus or to India, they wrote it down. And they also wrote down where those people may have come from, and they even drew maps. So you have to ask yourself, where did they get that information? How did they know? And that's what that's what that quote's about. Okay, moving on. Their very names and yet have preserved no memory of that knowledge. Once the plain truth is made known, the plot of the conspirators becomes evident on all sides, and the fabricators of spurious history are seen to have gone to such absurd lengths, among others, as to invent the fabulous tale of the lost continent of Atlantis, described by Plato. In order to carry out their purpose, to obscure Ireland's great past, the great past, known if known, would at once prove to the whole world that Ireland was the original parent country of learning, the sciences, the spiritual culture, and the motherland of true religion. This fact is cryptically preserved by the tradition and myth that schools were established there by Olam Olo, which name means doctor or professor of science and indicates the high hierophant of the Irish Magian sun cult. It is also alluded to that the story of Cadmus, the first one, that's what Cadmus means, first one, the first to establish schools. It is further confirmed by tradition, veiled in cryptic form, that the long before real or actual schools were established there, a certain Phineas Farsa, the sun and far, a man. So, okay, this is a little confusing. Phineas Farsa, those are both PH, so fin and far are PH words, meaning the sun, and far meaning a man, a Phoenician. So that's Phoenician with an F, F-I-N-I-C-I-A-N. -I -I Another side note. We also learn in this book that the word Phoenician, which is in the Eastern Mediterranean, where Syria and Lebanon is now, is spelled P-H, you know, Phoenician. Um, but he points out etymologically that you know, since the Hebrew language may have come from Celtic, or actually pre-Celtic peoples of of Ireland and Scandinavia and Northern Europe, that the real original word was spelled Phoenician with an F, F-I-N. Okay, so a Phoenician had established schools on the plains of Shinar, which means us, we, ourselves. This fabled place for the purpose of deception has been located in Persia. This is Phineas Farsa and the plains of Sinar. It is but a secret allusion to the fact that the Irish Magian adept cult of the sun worship who were on this land, on this island, were the first men to develop the latent or potential intellectual and spiritual powers within themselves, here erected in the first schools and laid the foundations for all of the culture, religious and secular, which exists in the world today. This is a fact of fundamental truth which nothing can shake or destroy. It is attested to on all sides upon close examination by the cultural idioms of the Bible and esoteric truths preserved in the symbolic monument of the Great Pyramid group in Egypt and elsewhere in the East. They have left indisputable evidence of this culture in the religious rites and institutions which they introduced here when they brought sun worship and civilization to both North and South America. There is most incontestable proof of this as will be shown later on. This purpose to obscure knowledge of her history and institutions may be further seen in the effort which has been made to create a doubt 
as to the origin of her round towers and the purpose for which they were erected. There is no doubt whatever in the writer's mind but that them to dispose of and that we are not surprised to find that they have on hand records which will show that many of those towers were destroyed by an act of nature instead of by the willful acts of ruthless destroyers. One of the methods employed by those fabricators to isolate and minimize Ireland's historical importance is pretty well reflected, as will be noted in the description given by Diodorus Siculus, intended for effect on posterity, portraying her as some obscure and little-known island in some remote and unfrequented part of the Atlantic Ocean just as if he were introducing a knowledge of her to the world for the first time or preserving her very name for oblivion. The excerpt which will show this implied mendicity on the part of Diodorus will also include as an authority the untruthful Geraldus Cambricenicia in referring to the latter. Mr. Donnelly, which is Ignatius Donnelly, Mr. Donnelly is evidently not aware of this untruthful character. So, we find him again, among others, in his role as an authority as we intended. Regarding to the Round Towers, those unique and peculiarly original Irish monuments connected with sun worship, Mr. Donnelly says, quoting, attempts have been made to show by Dr. Petri and others that these extraordinary structures are of modern origin and were built by the Christian priests in which to keep their church plate. But it is shown that the but it is shown that the annals of Ulster mention the destruction of fifty seven of them by an earthquake in AD four four eight, and Geraldus Cambricinus shows that Lao Ni was created by an intonation or sinking of the land in AD sixty five. Moreover, we find Diodorus Siculus in a well-known passage referring to Ireland and describing it as an island in the ocean over against Gaul to the north and not inferior in size to Sicily, the soil of which is so fruitful that they now mow there twice a year. Donnelly goes on to say, he mentions the skill of their harpers and the sacred groves and their singular temples of round form from the book Atlantis, page 416. Here we see a conflict of opinion in the statements attributed to Dr. Petri and others and Diodorus Siculus. We are reminded of a proverb which says, A lie must have long legs or it will be overtaken. The propagandists have evidently suffered a lapse of memory right here on this point regarding the antiquity of those towers. The effect of all this false information has been set men astray in their quest for the solution as to what country or people we are indebted to for those monuments. Sir John Lubbock quoted in the book Atlantis, they have been supposed by some to be Scandinavian, but no similar buildings exist in Norway, Sweden, or Denmark, so that this style of architecture is no doubt anterior to the arrival of the Northmen, that is, their arrival in Ireland. It seems puerile and absurd that any investigator possessing even the ordinary amount of acumen necessary to deal with the subject of the round towers should honestly think much less circulate the opinion that the towers were built in Roman Christian times and gives a reason that it was a place where the priests kept their church plate. It is to say the least disingenuous. The knowledge necessary to the solution of the question of the round towers is not obscure or remote for men who even in the smallest measure have given thought to the investigation of this, these things symbolic. The explanation of the round tower is simple, and the purpose of it, its use, easy to apprehend. The understanding will at once enable anyone to determine in what country it originated and who the builders were. Those who were responsible for disseminating misinformation know this fact well. The misinformation is but a part of the plan of concealment. The round tower is peculiarly an Irish or Aryan symbol of the sun worship. In their worldwide migrations to preach the gospel, the Irish erected the towers in association with their temples. They are symbols of the phallus and represent the creative power of God. 
through the Lord's son, Iessa. Iessa, another side note, Iessa is the original name in ancient Irish for Jesus or Jesus. Both in nature and in man. I'll repeat that. They are the symbols of the phallus and represent the creative power of God through the Lord's son, Iessa, both in nature and in man. It has a natural, mystical, and spiritual significance, the same idea that has been borrowed and embodied in the modern church spire. The remains of those towers are found as far from Ireland as India in the east and from Ireland to New Mexico and Colorado in the west. The author of Atlantis, page 418, most pertinently says, It will not do to say that the resemblance between these prehistoric and singular tower towers in countries so far apart as Sardinia, Ireland, Colorado, India, and India is due to an accidental coincidence. It is sometimes necessary in dealing with a shameless and persistent propaganda of falsehood to speak in a plain and direct manner, especially against powerful and subtle agencies which have been able, through means of a written page, as a medium for misinterpretation, either by the alteration or by omission altogether. So, successfully to obliterate and reduce to an unimportant and insignificant character the history or story of the greatest nation of ancient times, if not at all time. The commercial greatness of this nation was unrivaled. Her universities and schools of learning, not only in medieval times, but anciently, made her the intellectual son, S-U-N, of Europe. As Professor Sigerson of Dublin recently declared, without any exaggeration whatever. And with justice, he may supplement his statement and say that she was truly the intellectual light of the whole world. Her ethical culture has never been equaled, let alone surpassed, as evidence of our Bible, which when rightly understood with its ideal counterpart in stone, the great pyramid, temple, pillar of Iessa, is her crowning glory. So it becomes very apparent why there has been such an amount of feigned ignorance regarding the origin of the round towers and the failure of those with knowledge to give out correct information about them.